for your comments. Thank you. Thank you. I want to hear from T. He's a really great guy. So let's bring up Bob Ross. <laughs>
mean, we have, I, I'm at another place right now, and there, somebody talked to me the other day about our program up here in the music area. So it's not like it's just in Jefferson that people know about it. It's everywhere, you know. Anyway, I did, did want to talk about a couple more things with, with, with Pete and Jim. You know, these two guys decided to uh, make sure that we were always on the road. You know, before this, when you had a band, they would go on a trip and it would be exchange trip. You'd go to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, live in some, go in somebody's house and play a concert that night and come home. But all of a sudden, with Jim and Pete, they wanted to go all over the place. First big one, I think you said Canada. I thought it was Orlando. That was the third. Uh, close enough. Right? Anyway, and we, we started going on the trips all over the place. Orlando, you know, you went up to Canada. Jim was in Europe. Pete wanted to go to California you know, one year. I said, California? Why do you want to go to California? I said, well, next thing you know, you want to go to Hawaii. And that's what we did. We went to Hawaii. Now, you know, the thing that was smart about, they were smart about though, is that when, when Pete would go on his competitions, he would go, you know, all over the place in this area. But he knew enough when he went to Pennsylvania to go to Lehman Township, Pennsylvania, right? <laughs> Now, none of you know what we're talking about, except Pete and me. That's my old high school. So I was, I was home that weekend and found out about it, and I got to go up to my old high school and see my band performing. It was great. It was a great thing for me. And I let him go anywhere he wanted to after that. <laughs> now, the other side of the point is, you know, when you go on these trips, you have to raise money. So you talk about the fundraisers of all fundraisers. Every time I see that funky weaker being commercial, the guy with the turkey, the Christmas turkey or something like that, I think of these guys. Because they were always selling something. I mean, it would be fruit. I think I still have a couple of grapefruits in my refrigerator. Because you couldn't buy two grapefruits, you have to buy a case of grapefruits. Now what do you need a case of grape grapefruits? And then wreaths, you have my wreaths. Jim sold me a candle for $35. Larger than my electric bill back there. But it was a nice candle and it was sent. And you know, I think the, the one that took the cake was I bought charcoal from these guys and I had a gas grill. <laughs> anyway, you know, they were just they were totally active, always active, always working with the kids, which is what you want in your music program. And they certainly did that. You know, a couple of people did a couple other things. I don't know if all of you know this, but you know, there was a time that Pete was the head of the Teachers Association. Does that guy look like a tough negotiator or what? <laughs> right? And I think because of his personality, a lot of things got done. And they don't always have to be antagonistic to be in that position. The other thing is, Pete has a love for baseball. And he was an assistant baseball coach with Mike Young. I guess there was a picture to paint, wasn't there? Where did he get that from? He must have been listening to Mike, because God bless him, when you started talking baseball to Mike, you were there for a couple hours. And Pete did, did a great job. Anyway, one last thing, you know, something was a mention of Garfield. Garfield, excuse me, Garfield. And that's where Pete grew up, and that's where Pete started his career, and that's where we got Pete from. And I, I had the fortune, uh, a couple years ago, working in, from William Patterson, to be working with a school in Garfield, in an elementary school, and I'm sitting there with the principal, and I said to her, you know, Garfield's kind of a homey town. Everybody knows each other. I used to have a, a, a music director who was from Garfield. She said, really? What was his name? I said, Pete Tamello. She said, oh, Peter. I remember Peter. This lady was his sixth grade teacher, her first year of teaching. She said, he was so cute. And then I came back and I saw Pete. And I said, Pete, you know, I saw your sixth grade teacher, Margarita. T did not pick me as drum major for Jerry Giraffe. I was actually selected by his predecessor, Jesse Herring, who had left suddenly. And we were stuck in a summer wondering we were getting in our senior year. A bunch of us, whole new band director, had no idea what was happening, what was going to go on. And I remember I walked in the first day, his very first day on the job, and I was determined that there was no way I was wearing that band uniform another year. There was no way that he was not keeping me as drum major at. And I walked into his office that day and we had our little meeting and stuff and I, and I said, um, Mr. Tamillo, uh, Mr. Harris.
Jerry had told me that I could be drum major at next year, and we all know how tough Mr. Tamillo is, and he said there and said, okay. <laughs> so that is the real story of how I became his first drum major. And whether it was good or bad, I don't know, but that was it. He, um, he had a unique crowd that year. We, I guess we can pretty much take the credit for training him. We, he came into a program similar to what he started here. Wasn't a whole lot that we were doing with it. And he just took over and did an amazing job. That was the first year, I believe, that we made it to the Ridgewood competition. Um, we did parades down to Wildwood. That was, back then, guys, that was the big trip, going to Wildwood. We didn't get to do the Bostons and the Hawaii's and everything else. So we really thought we hit the lottery and we got to go to Wildwood. Um, we made it to, I believe, placed 11th in the Herald News Band Festival that year. And he just took our whole band program to, to new heights that we had not even seen. And it was really great for us in our senior year. And there's a couple of us here that, that played then, a couple others. It was just amazing. Even back then, we knew this was the teacher that everyone should have. He was always there. He was always caring. He always had time for you. Students were in and out of his office constantly. Um, you could always count on him. It was a particularly rough year for me. I had lost my dad that summer right before my senior year. So having someone like T around was just phenomenal because you always knew you can count on him. This is Tamillo. She was a trooper. Every Saturday, she was in the stands at the football games with her Steve and Art Bogey. He was our band mascot. We, she, you know, we thank you for being there and supporting us and lending your husband to us. And for all these years, I speak for Jefferson now for just giving him to us so that he can do all that he did for all these kids that have come through the Barfield Halls and through the Jefferson Township Halls. Now, yesterday, you don't know, I made a little quick stop and uh, I went back to Barfield High School because my original idea was that for the few of us that are playing in the band, I was going to go see the Gutter Bookstore and spread by Barfield Church. Well, if you haven't been back in a while, I have to tell you, there is no bookstore anymore. But I will tell you that the school has not changed much. The band room is probably exactly the way you left it. In fact, I think I saw a couple hall passes with your name underneath the bandstands. Um, and they gave me a couple things for you. If I can have Mike Gallagher, who was actually Mr. Tamillo's first band president, and I don't know where Chuck Table went. Mr. Marino is the current band director there, and um, by the way, due to a little incident yesterday and with the administration, they said there might be an opening, and if you would like to come back as the band director, you may have your old job back. But some of the things that they gave me, um, they gave me all your old original trophies that they had, still in the band room, on the shelf for all the things are... They were pretty dusty. I was going to bring them here as was, but I figured the cloud of dust would have made it from here to the back of the room. So my daughter cleaned them up for you. You have all your trophies going back to 1973, I want you to know. We also have another little thing in here for you. Since it was very odd that the three of us were here today, I found a picture from the Herald News of that first Herald News band competition you did with the three of us in it. So we have that for you. And Chuck, if you can take that out. I don't know if you remember Char Charlie Rigolosi. He is now teaching there and baseball coach. He gave us a Garfield Boilermakers baseball t-shirt for you since you're such a baseball fan. You know, we don't want you to be a stranger. We want you to come back. The kids here, we've had a phenomenal day. I've had some really good times. It's been like reliving my high school years. Even though it was only one year with T, I got to redo it again. When I first moved to Jefferson in that first year, I was walking across the field at Jefferson Day, and I was walking with my husband, and I said, the community band was playing, and I'm looking like this from down the field. I said, I think I know that guy. <laughs> And I walked up and I went, and that distinctive conducting style was there. I said, oh my God, it's Pete Tamilla. 
and then a couple years later, my son grew up, and lo and behold, he comes home one day in eighth grade and he says, Mom, we have to go to orientation this week. I said, well, marching band. I said, we're talking about marching band. He said, I'm joining the marching band. I said, but marching band's for high school. No, 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 I can go. I said, all right, we'll go, but I don't really think you can join eighth grade. So we get there, and I very immediately go up to Mr. Tamil the same way I did that first thing. I said, Mr. Tamil, I said, my son's only going to be in eighth grade. Can he really do this? He says, oh, yeah, yeah, we can have the middle school. And from there on, that's when we got started. And I've been reliving my high school years with all the band parents and all the fun, and it has been wonderful. And from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you and wish you all the very best of luck. Thanks.
she had five people respond to, to her and I rated her and everyone was a blue face. Uh, so we're thinking about other people that we can look for and at the time I was teaching so I looked through my name, uh, there's no, nothing there. I went to, uh, I was like, oh, let me see what, my, what people say about my dad. And I get to my dad and there were three pages of ratings. Every single one of them had a five out of five. Every single one of them was a smiley face with sunglasses. And that was the best rating you could get. So I guess that says a little bit of something about my dad. Um, I, know, I guess I, I will, uh, well, I got a, a kind of funny story. Uh, my dad is kind of a legend. Uh, everywhere I go, someone knows him. And uh, I, don't, I didn't tell my dad this yet, but uh, after getting out of teaching, I taught for two years. Uh, I became a, a trooper, and now, uh, you know, I work out of, out of Hamilton, and throughout the years, everywhere I go, and not even in just New Jersey, someone will come up to me and say, Tamilo, is it, you know, is that, you know, did your dad teach at Jefferson? Is your dad a music teacher? He was my teacher, he was great, you know, I get that from everywhere. I went up to Maine camping, the campground next to me. A girl came up to me, asked me if, uh, she found out, she heard someone say my last name, she said, Tamilo. Did your dad teach at Jefferson? I <laughs> uh, went up to Connecticut when I was playing in a band with uh, actually both of my brothers, I, I believe. Uh, after the show, two kids came up to me and they were in Connecticut. They were actually going to uh, Brown University. And uh, the one of them knows, your, your dad, Tamilo, is that the same as the, the, the guy that teaches at Jefferson? Yeah, that's my dad. So Two weeks ago, I'm on a... Uh, I'm working uh, patrol and I'm on the highway, I'm on Interstate 195 and you know, I'm sitting in the center median and a car passes me going about 90 something miles per hour. Uh, so you know, I turn on my lights sirens, pull them over and I get up to the car and uh, state troopers wear a name tag on their uniform. <laughs>
inspirational, but never pushy, mild-mannered, but uh, you always know if you've done something wrong. Um, humorous and sincere alike, and of course, handsome as hell. So, uh, one of my biggest regrets growing up uh, was not having my dad as my music teacher. Uh, I went to High Point High School. It's a little, a little bit uh, different being in the marching band there. Um, foolishly enough, though, he was always teaching us about life. We didn't really know it at the time. Um, unknowingly, he was framing me and my brothers and um, sister in his image and continues to inspire us. Uh, luckily, I was able to be a part of his world when I joined the Jefferson Marching Band in their wild, fun production of Newsies. Uh, I, there was, I don't know if it was even necessarily legal for me to be. Should I not talk about this? Uh, it's too cool. What does it matter now, right? Uh, but it was great. There were two different kinds of uh, competitions for fun. I remember it was CNBC and TOB, right? I was only allowed to march in one of them because there were like specific rules about that. Um, I guess I know that. But when I wasn't actually playing, I was crutching. I don't know if you guys remember it. Sean remembers that. Um, and it was just so much fun. It was so such a good time. It was really like being in like a, a Broadway musical. So I felt like um, it was awesome. But uh, a year later, when I was going to high school at High Point, um, playing Jefferson across the field, uh, I was completely envious of the Falcon Band. Um, their polished sound, their flashy moves, and uh, equally as flashy uniforms. Uh, we were wearing shirts and you know uh, jeans. Um, and of course, they're amazingly talented director across the field, my dad. Um, gathering with all of you here kind of brings us all back down to earth. We recollect our thoughts, shaded for years behind our collective hustle and bustle of life. Um, kind of take for granted how special things really are sometimes. And mem but memories are reborn on days like today, and we're not sure whether to laugh or cry sometimes. Um, elation and melancholy aside, these memories are always thwarted behind one simple letter, one single entity, and that is T. Uh, it will be interesting to see how life evolves now after Dad leaves teaching. Um, he devoted so much time over the years to his kids at school, especially during football season, as Pete was saying, that uh, his kids at home would only see him on Sundays. Uh, this was okay to all of us, though. We never, we never really minded because we always knew he was working it. Uh, doing it all for the right reasons here, for everybody. So, now that you'll be home more, uh, you can finally break in that leather recliner we got you. Kick back, watch the Yankees, and nod off into the night. And as if we're all notes in his symphony, he conducts us feverishly. We do as he envisions because we trust him with our lives. We are the harmony, the melody, the music of his life. And in his opus, he waves his baton, and we mimic the swaying of his hands because he makes us sound as best we can. All of the encouragement you've given me in my life um, will grow unparalleled. I'm so happy to know that your students and their families get to see what our family gets to see. Um, we're all your students, and we're all your family. And this uh, crying thing, this is from my mom's side of the family. <laughs> And it seems um, appropriate to let you know you're not just the greatest educator that we know, you're the greatest soul this earth has ever known. And I'm so proud of you, Dad, and I love you very much. and how to play the music, like dynamics, getting louder, and then getting softer, how to count rest or measures, or how to read a key signature. Every five months to one year, I learn a new, new note. The highest I have ever gotten, which was last week, I got to a high E flat above the staff. He has greatly encouraged me to play the best I could ever play. I owe my life to him for helping. I want to say thanks to you for helping me and the rest of the family, being an A++ teacher and the great dad, and for being there for when we needed you.
thank everybody for coming out today. This is such a special day for all of us. Um, just think how one little boy's love of music has affected so many people in his lifetime. And um, I wanted to just, for the Tamillo family, uh, just kind of bring back um, the memory of uh, Peter Tamillo Sr. And, and Howard Curley, who are stopping from playing their bocce tournament in the sky today. And, uh, and they're smiling down on, on Pete, and, uh, and, and they're enjoying his music today. Thank you. He's good friends, Tom Condra. place called the Choo Choo Club in Garfield. 
And then, needless to say, I was playing six nights a week, right off the bat. It's great, we're playing from nine to three o'clock in the morning. Well, in the summer, that's fine, but uh, they didn't call the Choo Choo Club the Choo Choo Club for nothing, you know, right, it was right next to a set of railroad tracks. And uh, as you're on stage, all of a sudden a train comes down the tracks, and uh, the bar was right in front of us, and we had a little extra percussive percussion instruments going on, the bottles in the bar rattling around and everything like that. And I was really expecting, I looked over to Pete, and I would, because of the train was rattling the building, I was expecting to go like this, Mark and it just... I was thinking Pete was gonna go something like that. So um, yeah, we played a lot, and the uh, six nights a week was quite a bit. When that summer was over, now most of us went back to school, so it was kind of hard because we were going to school, you know, during the day, playing. Some some of these venues were, you know, six nights a week. Back then there were no DJs. Bands you played from Tuesdays to Sundays, and nine to three. Um, there was another place we played at, at that, you know, around the exam time. It was a place called the Riverbell in Barfield. That was another six nighter. And you'd find us, uh, you know, during our breaks, Pete and I and a couple of the other guys, we'd be studying one, two o'clock in the morning, you know, during our breaks. Hey, I don't want to say that we were good in two shoes when, we didn't, when there were no exams. We were partying, you know what I mean? Okay. So uh, things started to evolve, and, uh, you know, we just uh, all of a sudden got locked up with a, a manager, his name was Joey D and uh, the Starlighters, and they had a kid in the 60s called the Pepper and Twist. And, uh, yeah, I know, it's pretty funny. But anyway, he took an interest in us. Um, you know, we started to uh, get some gigs and playing, started playing, you know, clubs out of New Jersey, in uh, Albany and uh, Lake George, uh, Saratoga Springs, where else, we were in Lake, uh, Long Island, that's right, and, uh, mentioned Albany, I guess. And, you know, we stayed at hotels. It was, you know, we started to feel like, hey, you know, this, this is something, something's going there. And we started writing songs. He was writing horn horn charts, were pretty innovative. And uh, next thing you know, I don't know, I think it was the manager that kind of got us locked up with this record producer. So he kind of liked the band. And next thing you know, we're into, we started, uh, we went to New York, uh, recording at some studios, one was called Music Core. And this, uh, this producer, by the way, he was an editor for a, a magazine back then, Record World Magazine. So we got to uh, this New York studio, it's called Music Core, and these sessions were long. You know, we didn't put a dime in, this guy paid for everything. And he would start at 10 p.m., you know, so we're playing gigs, we're doing a recording studio, 10 p.m., to we leaving 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, and uh, that was during the week. And we didn't think anything of it, and the producer said, he didn't really like what the, the engineers are doing at that studio, so he brought us into Capitol Records. Capitol Records. Now we're now we're starting to think, hey, this, this might really, really mean something. And, uh, you know, back then, it's not like today, a lot of people could just go into a recording studio and record some stuff, but back then you had to have some kind of a connection to know somebody in the music industry to even get to these recording studios. So we thought, you know, things are happening. And, um, in that recording studio, our engineer was Les Paul Jr. Um, his father was Les Paul, the man that uh, made the famous Les Paul guitar. If you know about guitars, Gibson put that out. They're worth a lot of money today if you have a classic one. And uh, the producer wasn't happy with that either. Capital Records how many happy. So we, then we ended up in Les Paul Studios itself in Mahlon. Jersey he had a beautiful home with a studio, studio attached there, and um, we had a lot of fun. And, uh, put down the tracks. Finally, we clicked. We got a great recording. Mix. Actually, as we were recording too, Les Paul himself came down there and he said, "Hi, girls." You know, because we all had real long hair. And it was pretty interesting. But the thing about Pete, though, during our rest periods, because you know, like recording, sort of like what they do today. You know, you're recording in. In sections, in the tracking, you know, they had the rhythm section first, the horn section, and did the vocals, did solos, or the flute solo in the song, guitar solo, and then, you know, then some nuances with percussion or whatever. And we got that all down, and um, the guy says, okay, you know, because we started writing more songs then, and he said, uh, 
we got it. I'm going to go around to our record labels and uh, let's see what happens. But in the meantime, get ready for more, more tunes for an album. And we're saying, you know, we didn't really ask for this. It was falling our way, which is, which is pretty cool. And um, we speak, we're playing down in the Jersey Shore quite a bit and the other North Jersey uh, um, clubs. And it was pretty good. So one, one time after we uh, were rehearsing one night, the producer called us and uh, we just got finished with rehearsal. And uh, he calls up and he said, well, I shopped a lot of record labels and there's one that would really like it, Polydor Records. And we jumped around like little kids. I mean, hopping around was one of the greatest things. Um, that lived for about two weeks. The guy that wanted us, you know, he left Polydor. <laughs> the whole thing sank. But, you know, it was pretty cool because, you know, we had, uh, you know, we, had, we were doing concerts then. And in fact, uh, you know, got collages anywhere. There's, there's a collage that was in there that uh, had some pictures of us. We had a lot of write-ups in uh, Pearl News, Star Ledger, the record, the Newark News. And I guess the, the concert that really, you know, it was advertised a lot. There was a lot of... Uh, um, information about you know when the concert was going to be it was our very first one and we were all worried we were thinking hey, how many people are going to show up you know so we were Garfield High School and Sharon was there she'll remember this and um, it turned out to be packed not every seat was taken people were sitting in the aisles and it was I guess you know the, the fire code laws were probably a lot more lax back then because I don't think they would allow that but we had we did two shows and then Pete uh, was interviewed between the two shows, and uh, this way I have to find this now because I worked hard on this and think I could find it, right? But I remember him saying in the article, he said, you know, um, he told the people, he told the interviewer, he said, uh, I live my music, Saeed, breathe, and sleep my music. And man, he's 20 years old, and uh, this guy's already has his, you know, feet planted firmly on the ground, and uh, Tells you a lot about him. He was 20 years old. He said that 21. And oh, by the way, we're talking about ages now. We were both uh, we we're both 55, and um, we were 20 years old at the time. But there's this is something that's interesting. Um, Pete and I are five months apart. Pete was born in September 1949. I was born in February 1950. Now, you know how he can make you feel good, and then sometimes. This way he did it without trying because he has to say he was born in the 40s. I can only say I was born in the 50s. <laughs> so we had a we had a great time and uh, no oh while we're in that studio by the way um, you know it was mentioned that Pete likes to sleep but uh, there's a picture in that collage of me and him and I'm sleeping but he's not he's studying a chart. He was always in between those breaks he was at the piano and he was you know. He, uh, practicing his trumpet, and uh, but I remember being on gigs with him. I think we played at Temple University one time. We came back, and I was driving, and I had because we our, our stuff was in the van, and we're coming back. And uh, Pete's, you know, I'm talking away. For about an hour goes by, and everybody in the van is sleeping. But I said, okay, well, I shouldn't shouldn't say anything. But then when timepiece came around, Pete used to ride with me to the gigs all the time. And no sooner would be finished with the gig, we'd pack up and we're driving out of the, you know, the place and I'd be, we'd be talking for a little while. And of course, within 10, 15 minutes, uh, Pete's like <laughs> So I tried to get it, you know, as, as gigs went by, I tried to get a jump start on it. So as, just as we got into the van, because I like to talk, I can't sleep when after a gig. You know, being a drummer, we're nervous anyway, so. And, driving out, and as soon as I'm getting out of the car, I'm going to start talking now, and I start a conversation, and all of a sudden... <laughs> but every once in a while, I guess he felt guilty, and he wanted want me to make him feel bad. He, once in a while, you know, like Tim Allen, he would grunt, you know, mm. 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 So I don't know if he was just being polite or being annoyed for the thing. But I have to... Well, Jim, I wasn't going to bring up timepiece, because uh, I was just wanted to bring up the point that uh, this experience that Pete and I had with this band, I think maybe had a little bit to do with, um, you know, how we um, treated a situation with the student when they were looking for a career in performing music, and that, you know, um, 
don't forget, you know, because we had some hard times. It wasn't easy for us to try, you know, to get where we wanted to get, and it fell through. But uh, you know, he would probably say to you, I'm probably, you know, I hope it's right that you know he would say, uh, you know, it is tough, it's hard, but go with your dream. I mean, you can't, you don't know until you uh, until you try. Is that am I in the mark on that? I hope. <laughs> so anyway, uh, it was a, it was a great experience, and I don't know. Pete so humbly probably never told that story to anybody, but he could have been a bona fide rock star. Think about that. You know, that's yeah. rock and roll Pete. Actually, I think he's got his little schlipper. I think that this thing with this is a, a ruse with him playing uh, working at the music then. I think he's going to have a, a hip hop career now. <laughs> Um, I wanted to get to, I wasn't because I don't want to take up too much time, but since Jim brought up timepiece and that, that thing about the, uh, the Elks Club, there was one part of that thing that he, that speech at the end, and if Jim you, uh, didn't mention that, the place is deathly quiet when, when this uh, speech is going on. By the way, I'm a drummer, so I'm allowed to jump around. Okay? So, these people are holding up candles, and it's, you can't hear a pin drop, but you got four guys, and I went to Catholic school, I mean, you couldn't laugh in class, you know, you couldn't, you know, you told it in, you know, and that makes you want to make laugh even more. But it wasn't until that part that they got to, um, swells and throbs, and Jim's next to me over here, and I hear, you know, he's got that laugh with that wheeze. <laughs> that we played at, and it, oh, I, I was not, I was always a rock drummer, this social band that, that Jim was, uh, or society jam, the Jim band, as Jim had put it, um, I wasn't used to playing the standards, I was a rock drummer, but, you know, we started playing weddings and stuff like that, and uh, we played at this one place, and somewhere in Central or West Jersey or something, and it was a, it was southbound, it was, it was a fire, no, no, that's a different one, it was a fire company, and we had played there two gigs, actually. And um, we got there, and they opened up the garage for us. Now, the, like, nothing against a fire people, man, they they do a great job. But this is this is like going down to somewhere in Alabama, and it was in New Jersey. But they opened up these bay doors, and they let the trucks out. We pull our equipment in, we set up, but they close the garage, the garage doors behind us. So just like this, actually, it's convenient because you know we just put our put our stuff out, set up. At the end of the night, garage doors went up, backed up our equipment. But uh, there were, how long ago this was that Billy Joel had a song on it just at that time, uh, Just the Way You Are, and he sang it. See, we had to, we had to start singing because we were a smaller band now, so we had to spread the vocals around a little bit. And Pete was singing, the, you know, Don't go changing. And all of a sudden there's a guy that comes up to him, and he right in his face. <laughs> And, I mean, what is it that people, you know, there's a whole band there, but they open, when somebody doesn't know about music, or they come right to the person that's singing, not to go to somebody else who's able to talk, you know, but they're coming up, and this guy's face is right here, and he was not too nice. And he was giving it to Pete, and kind of yelling at him. And Pete's still singing, and if you know about, you know, how Pete is quick to, to smile and quick to laugh, but you know, he's got a really nice smile. But you know, do you ever see that smile on him once in a while when he goes... <laughs> That's a smile at Pete is tits, man. You don't want to mess with him. So, but he's, he's still, he's still uh, singing, but this guy's really razzing him. I mean, the guy was really obnoxious. I felt like throwing the stick at the guy. And Pete's there, and being very polite trying to. Well, the guy was there for a long time, just wanted us to stop that song right then and there, and go on, he wanted us to do some, you know, old standard kind of music. So, I had never seen this from Pete, finally he says, get out of my face. <laughs> Sit down! Now! <laughs> guy listened to me, crawled back to his seat, that was great. So then, we had another job after that, at the same place. And then we decided, 
the night before we had a gig, we're saying, okay, we're gonna wear tuxedos, but wouldn't it be great if you all wore white athletic socks with the tuxedos? <laughs> So I said, yeah, and, you know, it was, we were doing for things for spite, but, you know, we, we, it, was, it was harmless in a way, you know, so it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, Jeff uh, Foxworth is worthy, you know, I can say, if you wear white socks with a tuxedo, you just might be a redneck. <laughs> so we wore this, and we didn't think that we were all going to do it, and sure enough, we all show up at the jobs, and there we all having these white socks, and it didn't look too cool. So we got there, set up. And we're waiting for the comments. Nobody left. <laughs> they took it as being normal. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. We didn't we didn't make it as a success in in, in the eighth day. Um, that was the name of the band. I don't know if I mentioned that before. But um, Pete didn't need that situation to be successful. He's successful in life. He's successful with his family. He has a great friend. Um, He's an unbelievable human being, one of the greatest on the, on the planet as far as I'm concerned. I'm very proud of him that he's, he's made this accomplishment in teaching. And, uh, you know, his journey continues, and this is not the end, it's, it's a joyous occasion in a way. He might annoy his uh, family a little bit, but they'll get through that. Or they'll get through that. But you know what, I gotta say something about Sharon, okay? Because, no, I mean, Sharon was, you know, when the, when, when the eighth day was first playing and we played at Montclair State, and she was this beautiful strawberry blonde girl, hair down. She was just a really nice person. Same as she is today. Pete and her are very consistent. And they have great kids, you know, Peter and Julie and John and Pat. And uh, couldn't ask for, you know, a nicer set of friends. And I'm very honored. I have him as a, my friend, my, my buddy P. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, congratulations, my friend. Thank you. Wow, it's quiet. <laughs> All right. Well, this is the uh, part of the program where we decided we would give P an opportunity to rebut any comments. Yeah. <laughs> of course, after he's done speaking, the band comes back up, so we actually ultimately have the last word. But uh, please welcome Pete up.
60 alumni, 70, and it just kept going up. So I didn't expect it to be this, and I really appreciate everybody that's here tonight uh, for your time. Uh, I just consider myself to be uh, another quote, just an ordinary man, and nothing more. So this has never been about me, this has been about the kids, it's been about the school. So, Bob, I want to thank you. You hired me. You took a chance. Sorry, the only thing they didn't. The only thing Bob never told me in the interview is when uh, I got here that the mar marching band was voluntary. And I started, I had 18 kids. So I said, time to go to the middle school. And they let me. And I, I recruited 12 eighth graders. And they had no idea what they were getting into. In fact, Bob, Bob Malone came down and he played tuba. I well, no, he didn't play. He played bassoon and he played piano. And I stuck a tuba on him. I said, learn to play. I didn't teach him anything. I said, just learn to play. There was tons of them like that. Uh, we had another tuba player, Johnny Ellett. Same thing. He played saxophone, right? And I stuck a tuba on him. You're big. Play tuba. <laughs> first year and then it grew from that. The only thing about Bob, which was, I don't know how many of you faculty are here that have experienced this, was ever you did something wrong, you got a little piece of paper in your mailbox that said, please see me today. I got one of those one day after a football game on a Saturday. Now my thoughts going to remember this one. The band didn't get much respect in the beginning. We had to fight for every inch we had. And uh, I remember the halftime show out here one game, and I had the script sent up to the announcer, and at the beginning of the halftime show, we were announced as the Rodney Dangerfield Marching Band. <laughs> we just don't get no respect. Please see me Monday morning. <laughs> for a better principal. Uh, and Ginny's right in those steps. Dennis Nick was right there. They've all been good principals, been supportive of our program. Um, and, you know, they, as much lead, the leeway as they gave us, they also steered us in the right directions, too. Now go, let's go to Garfield. Okay. I, when I left Garfield to come here, we had a, uh, a, a tradition in football of losing. Okay. I had no idea what the Notre Dame fight march was. And that's an inside joke. Because you know we're going to play that after you score a touchdown. We didn't have to rehearse that in Garfield. So I came up here. The first game, we tied Morris Catholic. They were ready to have a parade. I couldn't figure out why until I figured out they weren't winning many games either. I was beginning to think it was me. But we went 0-8-1 that season. And then it was uphill from there. We had some great, some great years with football. In fact, one of, one, of the, uh, one of the benchmarks for the football season was I would go to Ed Levins, and i say, hey Lev, should I practice the Notre Dame Victory March, or should I not bother? And he would tell me, with a smile, get it ready, or uh, maybe not too many times. <laughs> And some of you sitting out there maybe played it a few times during the season, but some of you sitting out there seemed like we played it every other possession. We had some dynamite, dynamite football teams here in Jefferson under uh, John Sinati and his leadership. Um, and I think Bob will remember these two. We had a thing called Sergeant Slaughter. After each victory, the football team on Monday night's practice would bury the mascot of the team they beat. The best one, the most infamous one I remember is I borrowed the Pope's costume from Madrigal and I did the eulogy as we buried Pope John. <laughs> Clancy. They, they brought him in in a hearse. 
because he was on the Board of Education in Lenape Valley. Brought him in a hearse and a casket, had a backhoe, dig a trench, and lowered the casket into the trench. Then they started throwing dirt on it, and that's when he got really nervous. <laughs> he, actually, he, he actually thought he was being buried. We, Viking funeral. We had the fire department and everybody across the street at the pond, and they floated a canoe out there, lit it on fire, and buried the Vikings from burning. That went on all season. That was a state championship year. It was a, it was a great year. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over to my kids for a second, um, and my family. Uh, I don't, I have no, there's nothing better than my kids. Uh, they're musicians, and uh, public servants, they're great students. Um, what I try to do with them is just give them their own leeway. Uh, yeah, I corrected them sometimes when they were wrong, but just wanted to give them a safe and secure life. And I think they, they, they work for that. They, they earned it and they're, they're great kids. My wife is a saint. Uh, for actually staying married for 33 years to the phantom husband. Uh, I figured out one day, I sat here one day, and during marching band season from September to mid-November, I was home on the average of one day in 32 years. Uh, football season was quite consuming here. And, uh, I think it's tall, but I, I think a success of a happy marriage, ours anyway, is never seeing each other. <laughs> but I was home at least four times.
was sad. Je Jesse had a lot of, lot of life problems, and, and uh, he had a heart attack and passed away. So I became the high school band director full-fledged with Jesse's passing. It was, it was, it was sad. And uh, at that point, we were, we were married, moved up to Newton, and the drive down the Barfield was just was killing me. And it was a rough commute every morning, and you know what that corridor is like on 15 now? It was no better 25 years ago. So when the job opened here, uh, there was a teacher in Garfield by the name of Betty Sanders who had a student that went to this school, Bob Malone, and his father was a board secretary. And they told me about the position I applied, Bob hired me, and more or less the rest is history from there. But that's, that's the Garfield years. Uh, great kids, I set the tone first day in marching band. You know the big guy that was holding the trophies up here? Mike Gallagher. First rehearsal, first day of marching band, band president, get out of here. I threw him out. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mike. I, I hope I didn't score you too much, but I threw him out. He was horsing around, and I had to set the tone, and it was good after that. Came back, great guys here today, again, with Diane as the drum major. Yeah, it was okay that you were drum major. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> But you were good, you were good. All right, uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, Tommy and Jim, we've been, uh, been together a long time. We did the timepiece stint for 12, 13 years or whatever it was. And uh, we saw a lot of each other's lives with our kids and a lot of hardships here and there too. And uh, you're, you're very close to me. I guess you're so close to me. I'm gonna talk about Tom. Tom had a, uh, a wedding to, his, to Diane, and we had to go for tuxedos. Oh, God! <laughs> Jim wasn't with us because Jim was going, you played the wedding. Oh, that's right. Jim was stuck here doing the musical. <laughs> so, Tom, <laughs> stuck here. So, Tom and, and the rest of the bridal party went out for tuxedos. And uh, all I remember is getting home about 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, that's just tuxedo fittings. Because <laughs> I, I, I remember waking up at the traffic light on Oak Ridge Road, Route 23. <laughs> One of Tom's cousins never made it home at all. And Tom was in such a state that night, it was emotional. That's all it was, just pure emotion. The nervousness of being married. He was so bad that night, I had to take his contacts out of his pockets. <laughs> and I was in no shape for doing that either. Hold that eye open, Tom. Here I come. <laughs> and Jim, Montclair State College, uh, oh boy, we were fraternity brothers. And uh, you, you know the movie Old School, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Wynn had a nickname. He said, I can't say it. But if you saw old school in the beginning, were the guys running down the street? <laughs> uh, that, wasn't, that wasn't Jim. That wasn't Mr. Wynn. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, working in Jefferson, uh, we have used a term called Falcon Family. And uh, it is. Uh, it's always been that way here. I think the, uh, the administration of school uh, directed that way, and the faculty. Uh, we all know we have a, a job to get done, and uh, to uh, you know start September and get the kids out of here in June. But the uh, it's it's a group effort, you know, from academics and uh, you know you can talk about health and phys ed, related arts, fine performing arts. It's just a group effort to get everybody there. Uh, there's always one thought that I've um, always kept in mind, though, and um, it's never to take yourself too seriously. Um, if you can't laugh at yourself, uh, your life is too short. And uh, often, and many, many times, I've laughed at myself, and I uh, keep things in perspective. Um, uh, I think I thank my friends here, my neighbors. And um, most of them will use any excuse for a party. So that's why they're here today, because they, there's no alcohol though we're in school, so you can't drink. For my
my family, uh, other than my kids. Uh, you're probably the most important thing to me. Uh, it's a very unique clan, the Tamillos and the Curleys. I have, uh, have a great mom, and I have a great mother-in-law, and, uh, and two special people, uh, my dad and my father-in-law, who aren't here. All of you have extraordinary hearts, and uh, it does come from the mellow side too. <laughs>
which is inside your turn. And I think there's a, a guest book. And my wife just told me, make sure you tell them those things. Thank you again, everybody. with Sharon Tamillo and Sharon today is a special day for your husband uh, what would you like to say to him today well I'm just very proud of him and all the uh, the love that he's given to everybody in the community uh, of Jefferson and to be able to uh, share his feelings and love for music with everybody in town and to see that and how it's grown with everybody coming out to um, to embrace him today it's wonderful it's really great real nice celebration and are, are you looking forward to tonight's events? I understand oh, there's a lot yeah. of coming definitely. in. Oh, yeah, definitely. And all of our children are playing. I'm the only non-musical one in the family, so I'll just be cheering for them. But uh, it's going to be a wonderful concert. Excellent. Really nice, nice performance. Great. Right. And I think it's impressive that all your kids are all into music as well. Yep, they got the, their dad's jeans. <laughs> <laughs> terrific. Well, thank you very much. Thank you thank so you. much. Bye. Hi, I'm here with Debbie Smead, and she's a 1967 graduate of Jefferson High School. Debbie, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Um, what would you like to say today to Pete Tamillo? I, I understand that you're one of the founding members of the marching band. I was in the marching band when we first started here at the high school. The first year, we didn't have a marching band. Uh, the second year, in 19... 64 to 65 we finally got band uniforms went to our first football game thinking that we were all great and wonderful hi i'm here with trudy who is pete's mother-in-law and this is his special day and what would you like to say to him well i wish him all the best in the future and i remember him coming to my house with my daughter with his long hair and his beard <laughs> And we always thought that he was a great kid. We all loved him, my husband and I. Loved him from the beginning. And I hope he has a wonderful life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Like you wouldn't know who that is, but I guess the idea is that 
this one, yeah, no favoritism. Uh, so I start my, my routine, they ask me to do a couple scales, and, uh, and I start fouling up miserably. And I see him start shaking his head. And uh, then I start getting nervous. And I guess they help me out. We also have to do a piece. So I do the solo and I just pretty much destroyed that as well. And I see his head go down. And uh, wow, you know that? He's always been a very soft spoken guy. And you don't, you, everybody here knows he doesn't yell, he doesn't scream, but that, well, not anymore. Yeah, not, anymore. <laughs> not, not as much. But uh, that shaking of the head and the head going down, uh, I felt like I let him down. That was a tough year, because I, I got in, but I got in as like second chair, and, and he later spoke to me about, what was that? What were you doing? So I, I felt like I let him down tremendously. So on, on an up note, uh, after I graduated, I stayed in touch with Pete. Um, I always wanted to be, like I said, at the music of internet, playing in the band. I want to play with his wedding band. Um, I guess I had an opportunity to help Pete uh, in the summer work on a deck. <laughs> and somebody, was it Tommy's? Yeah, it was, that's right. Oh, yeah? The big heavy one? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. That's kind of your problem. So, he asked me to come help him, and I figured, well, you know, this is, a, this is an interesting way to bond with Pete, I'll go help him build a deck. Oh, as fate would have it, I helped him build a deck on my 21st birthday. We didn't have any alcohol, so that's not where it went, but uh, I saw a side of Pete that I didn't know. And, and, you know. We put, what, two by 12s together, like three or four of them, nailed them all together, and that was going to be the beam. And uh, he throws it up on his shoulder, he goes, all right, we're going to go up this ladder and put it up on top of the post. And I look at him, I look at me, I'm like, all right, all right, I'll put it up on my shoulder. I couldn't get up past the second step of uh, the stupid ladder. My calves were screaming, whoop, right up to the right up to where he had to go, and he's leaning over, and now the, the beam is like this. And I said, this is what, this, that's my music teacher. And he's an amazing guy. Uh, that's, that's the point I'm trying to make. And, and I got to learn a side of Pete, not just building text, but I got to learn Pete as a friend. Um, there's stories we can tell. A girlfriend of Dave's, and I'll, I'll leave the expletives out. A, a former girlfriend of Dave's uh, had a familiarity with uh, the F word, and uh, Laura. <laughs> she she tended to use this word in every sentence, whether it was good morning, good night, hello, how are you, do you want a drink. She always threw this. The kids might know it as the F bomb. She threw the F bomb into everything. We got abuse from out of it, but when she interacted with P, soft spoken, nice guy P, we. We thought it was even more amusing. Well, Pete waited until the last opportunity of the day as he was saying goodbye to say, nice to effing meet you, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> so those are my little tidbits about Pete. Uh, it's been a joy seeing everybody. It's been a joy working on this again um, and, and, and working with Pete. It, the, the real crime here, and it's, it's not a crime because he's moving on to greener pastures, but the crime here is all the kids that don't get the opportunity to be in his classroom. The kids that don't get to see him show you a snippet of the Blues Brothers and somehow twist that into music theory. <laughs> uh, we need to keep Mel here with a hat. My son, I have a son here now, he's four and a half years old. He's, he's lurking around here in a tuxedo, and it's not, not because he wanted to be noticed, it's because he was at a wedding today. I always thought my son would, would grow up under Pete's tutelage, but that's, yeah, that's too far off. He's only four and a half. So, thank you, Pete. There's, there's several of us right here uh, that wanted to do this for you, to be a part of this, um, and, we, and we wouldn't have it any other way. So, from us, we'll give you another question.